unconstitutional, unfair, or deceptive acts. As, as FTC Chairman Maureen Olhausen recently said, and I quote, the FTC's ability to protect consumers and promote competition in the broadband industry isn't something new and far-fetched. We have a long-established role in preserving the values that consumers care about online. Or, as President Obama's first FTC chairman put it just yesterday, the plan to restore FTC jurisdiction is good for consumers. The sky isn't falling, consumers will remain protected, and the internet will continue to thrive. So let's be clear. Following today's vote, Americans will still be able to access the websites they want to visit. They will still be able to enjoy the services they want to enjoy. There will still be cops on the beat guarding a free and open internet. This is the way things were prior to 2015, and this is the way they will be once again. Now, our decision today will also return regulatory parity to the internet economy. Now, some Silicon Valley platforms, giants, favor imposing heavy-handed regulations on other parts of the internet ecosystem. But all too often, they don't practice what they preach. Edge providers regularly block content that they don't like. When you go online, do you decide what news, search results, and products you see? Perhaps not. They regularly decide what you see and, perhaps more importantly, what you don't. And many thrive on the business model of charging to place content in front of eyeballs. What else is accelerated mobile pages or promoted tweets but prioritization? What is worse, there is no transparency into how decisions that appear inconsistent with an open internet are made. How does a company decide to restrict someone's accounts or block their tweets uh, because it thinks their views are inflammatory or wrong? How does a company decide to demonetize videos from political advocates without any notice? How does a company expressly block access to websites on rival devices or prevent dissidents' content from appearing on its platform? How does a company decide to block from its app store a cigar aficionado app, apparently because the company believes that the app promotes tobacco use? You don't have any insight into any of these decisions, and neither do I. Yet these are very real, actual threats to an open internet. Ironic, coming from the very entities that claim to support it. Ironic, too, that so-called net neutrality advocates, most vigorously opposed to our reforms, have little to nothing to say about these threats. These are omissions, these are threats that a growing number of officials, Democrat and Republican, House and Senate, are beginning to take notice of. Now look. Perhaps certain companies support saddling broadband providers with heavy-handed regulations because those rules work to their economic advantage. I don't blame them for taking that position. And I'm not saying that these same rules should be slapped on them too. What I am saying is that it is not the job of the government to be in the business of picking winners and losers in the internet economy. We should have a level playing field and let consumers decide who prevails. Now, many words have been spoken during this debate, but the time has come for action. It is time for the internet once again to be driven by engineers and entrepreneurs and consumers, rather than lawyers and accountants and bureaucrats. It is time for us to act to bring faster, better, and cheaper internet access to all Americans. It is time for us to return to the bipartisan regulatory framework under which the internet flourished prior to 2015. It is time for us to restore internet freedom. I want to extend my deepest gratitude to the staff who have worked so many long hours on this item. From the Wireline Competition Bureau, Anik Banoon, Joe Kalashone, Megan Capasso, Paul Exech, Ben Childers, Nathan Egan, Madeline Finley, Doug Galby, Dan Kahn, Melissa Kirkle, Gail Krutov, Susan Lee, Ken Lynch, Pam Megna, Chris Monteith, Ramesh Nagarajan, Eric Ralph, Deborah Salons, uh, Shane Taylor. From the Office of General Counsel, Ashley Boisel, Jim Carr, Christine Fargetstein, Tom Johnson, Doug Klein, Marcus Mayer, Scott Novak, Linda Oliver, and Bill Richardson. From the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, Stacey Ferraro, Neshe Gundelsberger, Garnet Hanley, Betsy McIntyre, Jennifer Salas, Paroma Sanyal, Jimmy Shang, Don Stockdale, and Peter Trachtenberg. From the Office of, Office of Strategic Planning and Policy Analysis, Eric Berger, Mark Baikowski, and Jerry Alec. From the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, Jerusha Burnett, 
from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, Ken Carlberg, and from the Media Bureau, Tracy Walden. With that, we will call the vote. Commissioner Clyburn. I dissent. Commissioner O'Reilly. Aye. Commissioner Carr. Aye. Commissioner Rosenworcel. I dissent. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks to the staff for your terrific work on this item. Madam Secretary, could you please announce the next item on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the fifth item on your agenda will be presented by the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau and is entitled Amendment to Harmonize and Streamline Part 20 of the Commission's Rules Concerning Requirements for Licensees to Overcome a CMRS Presumption. Don Stockdale, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Mr. Stockdale, once you and your folks are arranged, the floor is yours. Mr. Chairman, may I interrupt a little? I just oh. want to know if his telephone's off. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner, I did turn it off. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, reminded me. Vibrate would have been fine. That's right. <laughs> uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, I am pleased to present to you the CMRS Presumption Report and Order. I am joined at the table today by Suzanne Tetro, Roger Noel, Kathy Harris, Tom Reed, and Jessica Griffinius. In addition to the staff at the table, I would like to thank the Commission staff listed on the slide for their input. Tom Reed will now present the item. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Good afternoon. We present to you today a report and order that updates and harmonizes our regulations regarding the classification of commercial mobile radio services and private mobile radio services, primarily by eliminating sections 20.7 and 20.9 of the Commission's rules. These rules classify or presume certain services to be either commercial mobile radio services, or CMRS, or private mobile radio services, or PMRS, based on the frequency band used to provide service either service rather than on the, the characteristics of the service provided. That approach is premised on a paradigm developed more than 20 years ago when the Commission's rules contemplated distinct wireless services in each band. It is inconsistent, however, with the Commission's current flexible approach to licensing, which generally permits a licensee to provide any service it wishes subject to the technical rules and service for that band. This report and order will remove any presumptions about whether mobile services are regulated as commercial or private and instead allow licensees to rely on the statutory definitions of those terms to identify the nature and regulatory treatment of their mobile services consistent with applicable service rules. Eliminating 20.7 and 20.9 will reduce disparate regulatory treatment of similar services and different frequency bands. It will allow licensees to offer a variety of services rapidly in response to consumer demands and competitive forces, and it will help it will help bring beneficial services to businesses, state and local governments, and the public safety community while reducing the administrative burdens and processing delays that certain providers of these services currently face. The Wireless Telecommunications Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges to make technical or conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reed, for that compelling presentation. We'll now turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner Clyburn. Thank you. What I'm about to say is reinforced if the cameras were to look at the uh, rear of the room. If the topic of Part 20 of the Commission's <laughs> rules were introduced at the average American dinner table, it might go over as well as a serving of Rocky Mountain oysters. Neither would be well, <laughs> warmly received at my home. Man, that's just wrong. <laughs> I mean, even, even we have limits here, Commissioner. <laughs> okay. The changes proposed in this order, coupled with the majority's dismantling of the open Internet, you knew it would end soon, uh, have many unsavory implications for the future of competition policy. You're wondering how it's going to tie that in, right? <laughs> As I made clear in my statement opposing the rollback of our open internet rules, I believe the proper interpretation of section 332 of the Communications Act is that mobile broadband internet access service should be classified as a commercial mobile radio service or CMRS, not a private mobile radio service. Eliminating our current part 20 rules means we will remove precedent and procedures that could help parties demonstrate that a wireless company's mobile broadband service should be classified as CMRS. I understand that some may see this as a mere streamlining of commission rules, but in my opinion, this order removes important procedural safeguards, such as requiring the commission to put certain applications 
out on public notice, which can help inform parties who are interested in challenging a company's claim that its mobile broadband internet access services should be classified as a private mobile radio service. And since that result is inconsistent with my view of proper classification for mobile broadband services, I respectfully dissent from the order and will admit my first example might have been a little edgy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Clyburn. Uh, Commissioner Riley. Uh, thank the staff for the work, no statement. Uh, Commissioner Carr. Thanks. The United States leads the world in wireless. One of the reasons for this success is the FCC's decision to embrace a flexible use policy for spectrum. Instead of <coughs> mandating that a particular it's an emotional choked topic. Up, choked up on this one. <laughs> Instead of mandating that a particular spectrum band be used with a specific type of wireless technology or service, we generally leave that choice to the private sector, uh, which has a much better sense of consumer demand. This approach has enabled wireless networks in the U.S. to evolve with technology and to do so much more quickly than if operators had to obtain government sign-off at each step of the way. Our leadership in 4G is just one example of how this policy has worked to benefit consumers. Today, we carry that approach forward by eliminating 20-year-old rules that reflect a different approach to spectrum, one that required providers operating in particular spectrum bands to obtain FCC permission before innovating or bringing certain services to the market. This change will not only help level the regulatory playing field for wireless providers, but it will also result in more timely and efficient use of spectrum. The flexibility we provide today will be particularly important as we look to extend our global leadership in wireless as 5G and Internet of Things offerings continue to come online. I support the order and hope that we can continue the agency's efforts to identify and eliminate outdated and unnecessary regulatory burdens. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenbrussel. Well, in the interest of moving this along, I will say that uh, I support today's decision. It does not in any way alter the statutory definitions of CMRS or PMR 